Let us pray. Creator, we feel it. The atmosphere is shifting. The very air we breathe carries the remnant of dreams, hope, possibilities, burned to ash. Much like fires are consuming our beloved natural lands. Blown carelessly, recklessly by the wind, the very air of life in our world is contaminated, contagious, deadly. Holy Redeemer, the atmosphere is shifting. Words of hate spilling out of the mouths of leaders, filling the ears of the desolate, loud and brazen over airways from pulpits and in the streets. The disease of white supremacy metastasizing and showing up ever more aggressive, threatening, and terminal. Sustaining God, the atmosphere is shifting. It is choking the very life out of your people. Can you feel it? We believe you can. We believe you do. Source of light, the atmosphere is shifting. Your Holy Spirit is running free with power and fervor. Awakening minds, touching hearts, inspiring imagination, strengthening our resolve, making connections, demanding our response, and purposing our rage. The atmosphere is shifting. There is no back to normal, but with each breath, there is a way back to you. Back to love. Back to life. May we be open to the many new ways of being that creation is requiring of us. Amen. Our reading this weekend comes from the book of Genesis. We will learn from selected verses in chapters 37 and 50, which tell us the story of Joseph and his brothers. Now, we've made a significant leap in time since last weekend's reading about Abraham, Abraham hearing God's promise to be the father of a great nation. Since that day, Abram and Sarai have had a child who they named Isaac. Not only did they have a very late in life birth, they were also given new names, becoming Abraham and Sarah. Isaac grew up and, remar and married Rebekah, and together they had two sons, Jacob and Esau. After a rather dramatic tale of a younger brother stealing his older brother's blessing, and a pointed message about God's love and fidelity expanding beyond the customary, 
as well of a, as a powerful lesson on repentance and forgiveness, we come upon our story for today. Jacob has been given the name Israel and had 12 sons. Our story picks up with his youngest son, Joseph, sharing with his brothers his vision for his future. Now breathe and hear the word of God. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other children because, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field, Suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let's not take this life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into the pit here in the wilderness, but no, lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and where can I turn? Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in blood. They had the long robe with sleeves taken to their father, and they said, This is what we have found. See now whether it's your son's robe or not. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Je Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Now our reading of Joseph's story continues on many years later after Joseph has risen to a position of importance and power in Egypt. Facing drought and famine in their own land, Joseph's brothers journey to Egypt to seek relief from their hardship. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intend to do, do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. We now finish from a, with a reading from the Gospel of Luke. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Thanks be to God. This week, as I was visiting with the volunteers from our thrift shop, I was reminded of a family adventure I had many years ago. 
Christy and I had been dating for only just a few weeks, and while one day she would agree to marry me, at this point our relationship was still very, very much new. I'd driven up to Albany, New York to visit her at college, and we decided that we wanted to connect with a mutual friend of ours who lived just a little ways down the road. Now, being new to the area, we didn't really know how to get where we were going. So we took out a map. There was no GPS at that point. We planned our route and we headed out. As we began to drive, we uh, quickly got engrossed in deep conversation and we weren't paying that close attention to exactly where we were headed. After about 30 minutes of driving, we realized we, we should have been there by now and nothing around us looked at all familiar. Clearly, we were lost. Now, I was far from ready to admit that I had navigated us in the wrong direction. Knowing that we were supposed to be on Route 9, I looked in front of me and saw a sign that said 9W. So I insisted we must be doing just fine. Christy gave me a look of disagreement and said that we needed to pull over and ask for directions ask for directions? I don't think we're that desperate yet. I was confident that 9W meant that I was headed in a westerly direction on Route 9, which is exactly what I wanted to do. After about two more hours of driving around, having used up almost all of the gas in my tank and almost all the conversation there was to be had, I was ready to admit I had no idea where I was or how to get where I was going. With a little bit more, a little more than some shame, I had my held my head low and pulled over to a gas station and asked for directions. I would, however, like to impart this one piece of wisdom. Should you find yourself driving in Albany, New York on Route 9 and see a sign that says 9W, as it turns out, they're entirely different roads. I'm fortunate that Christy and I can look back on that October adventure and laugh. But this story is more than a humorous reminder of just how stubborn I was 26 years ago and maybe just a little bit still. But I think this story is an analogy for much of our living. How often do we find ourselves headed down the wrong path and entirely unwilling to admit that we've navigated our life incorrectly? How many of us choose to ignore the kind words of redirection from those who care about us, insisting instead on our own ways? How far down the road of mistaken turns will we go before we're willing to ask for help? Today we hear the story of Joseph and his brothers. These descendants of Abram, heirs to a great nation, they've certainly lost their way. Joseph, caught up in dreams of grandeur and a deep sense of entitlement, has spurred his brothers to react with jealousy and cruelty. In what might be one of the greatest case studies in family dysfunction ever written, Joseph's brothers throw him into a pit, sell him into slavery, and then convince their father that his favorite son has been killed. Years later, when drought and famine force them to seek help in Egypt, they find that their path of survival runs straight through their brother. Certain that he remains the entitled, resentful man that they knew him to be years ago, they concoct another lie to manipulate him into responding with kindness. Little did they know, though, their younger brother is not that same man. 
Joseph has discovered a powerful path of living. A path not determined by his own ego or pride, but a way of life grounded in God. With a heart inspired by the holy, he realized that true life will never be found when we act solely in our self-interest. Rather, we must rise above the noise, the noise of jealousy and power and greed, giving our hearts instead in compassion and in care. Joseph reunited with his brothers, and together they overcame the pain and division that had marred their relationship, showing that seeking unity with one another can be a transformative way to the holy. I don't know about you, but I often wonder just how far down the wrong path we as a people are traveling. It seems that we're living in the midst of a cacophony of selfish pride where leaders are quick to develop self-serving solutions and neighbors are eager to tear one another down in words of anger and contempt. I'll be honest, with each passing day, my soul grows more and more weary. Weary of the judgment weary of the fear, weary of the hate, weary of the injustice and ignorance and bigotry that swirls around us. Feels as though kindness and hope are drowning in the darkness. My faith, however, offers me the light with which to see. And I know, I know that I am not ready to surrender to the powerful forces of division, for I believe that God has given us a better way. Just as Joseph found a way out of his prison of fear and hate, we too must believe in the power of God's transformation, for in partnership with God, we can change our wounded world into an ecosystem of unity. In this season of choices, let us choose kindness. Let us expand our views, seeking to understand the depth and the pain and the weariness experienced by those bearing the weight of unjust systems. Instead of judging those who look or sound or love differently, let us embrace the gift of belonging that God has extended to all. For time and time and time again, God's grace has met us when we have traveled down the wrong road. God's forgiveness has been extended to us when we have dug our heels in and insisted in the error of our certainty. God's light has shone upon us when we have hidden our face in the darkness of doubt and shame. From Abraham to Joseph to Jesus to you, God has given the promise of true life. When we rise above the noise and ground our living in unconditional love, hope returns and a just world will be restored. The world around us may seem bleak and full of hate, but the ways of God are not lost. For we have been called to be a people of the promise who are willing to chart a new course and follow our path of deep understanding. The future has been yet to be determined. So let us be the voices that will shape a holier tomorrow. Let us we lead with the example of our welcome in which we proudly proclaim that all are worthy, that all 
are deserving and that all can exist together in the abundance of God's love. Let us extend our kindness and our generosity to those who've been pushed to the margins and give voices to those who've been silenced. For in partnership with God, we will feed the empty souls and we will restore the broken dreams and we will proclaim that with God, there is more than enough love to go around. Friends, if you are traveling down a dark and weary road, I invite you to trust in the power of transformation. For God will bring you home. You're never alone. Rather, we stand ready. Ready to love you. Ready to hope with you. To believe in the gift that is within you. We are a people of the promise, and we have set a place at the table for you. So come, feast on the wonder of God's light. For surely, goodness and love will lead us all the days of our life. Have hope. Have faith. Trust and believe that with God we will overcome and the world will know the power of our peace. Blessings, love be with you. Let us be a people in prayer. Living water, we come before you this day, lifting those who need your healing touch, your comforting presence, your reassuring word. Hear our prayers, we pray, and make us agents of healing in your name. Hear our prayers for those who, are live, who live in longing, Lord, longing for healing, for a job, for shelter, for justice, for food, for hope, for community, for relationship with you. Open the ears of your people, O God, that we might hear those longings being expressed, even in ways that make us uncomfortable, and stand with those who are hurting to seek your mercy. Our prayers for leaders who refuse to hear their people, Lord, 
for those hearts who are hardened and whose ignorance is blinding. Open their eyes, we pray, to the need for living wages, for safety, for disaster assistance, for food security, for reassurance, for justice of all, but mostly for compassionate presence and loving hands. Hear our prayers for those wandering in the wilderness of sin, not knowing which way to turn, not knowing how to find their way out. Guide them with your gracious hand, we pray. Make of your church a haven for the hungry, that all who encounter your church at work in the world may be transformed by it and welcomed into a new life in Christ. Help us, your children in the church, to get engaged, to be inspired, to innovate and recreate, to love and to serve, that we might part, be part of a building of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. We pray all of this, O God, in fullness and faith, as Christ has taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Put the hum of despair and disappointment behind you. Set your eyes on the hope of Christ. Give your heart over to the gift of love and put your hands in motion. Be the child of the church that you have been called to be. Stand for justice. Proclaim the promise. Heal the wounds of the world. God has formed you for this very moment that your life will be a blessing and your love a balm. So go and live free. Amen. Mm -hmm.